authorities and, of course, nationally. And there's an inquiry which is underway looking at how all that uh, was handled. But the, uh, I think one of the aims of, the, of that split, East and West, was to ensure there was greater capacity and focus on the needs of, of uh, a smaller number of local authorities rather than trying to work across all six. So this is getting on for 18 months, almost 18 months into that new, new model. Um, and since coming into post, we're, we're working on, on the stability of that system, getting uh, the public health teams uh, strengthened post-COVID and also developing the, way, the ways of working across all three. We also have a, a shared um, hub team, uh, which I manage and is hosted by Bracknell Forest, um, which, which again is, is very um, working very well. Essentially, it's a, the hub and spoke model. So the hub it sits within this council, uh, Bracknell Forest, and the spokes, in effect, are the three other local authorities. Um, and within the hub team, we have some shared functions. So primarily, the uh, the function around what, what we term health intelligence, which is a lot of the data and evidence and analytics and epidemiology of particular diseases and patterns. Um, and that uh, provides support to the three authorities and also to the, to the NHS, which was the clinical commissioning group, the CCG, and is now the integrated care board uh, since the 1st of July, or the ICB. And um, also sitting within the hub is the um, is some commissioning capacity we, we commission sexual health services across uh, Berkshire East and support commissioning in other areas um, uh, supporting and working with each authority and the, and the, the third key element is health protection o obviously um, since COVID health protection has become a paramount issue um, and it's probably fair to say that around the country, um, the capacity for health protection broadly, which is largely infectious disease prevention and control, uh, it, it has is quite variable. Um, so we're currently working through the process of, of developing our capacity in health protection going forward, working with the new national agency, the U UK Health Security Agency, which succeeded um, Public Health England last year. So, so. As you can probably see, the system is developing nationally and, and locally, but we um, we are working through and making some real progress, as as he was mentioned. Um, we can't underestimate the demands placed on the whole system by by COVID, as I mentioned. Um, and also, just to give a bit more context, um, again, it's may, may be a reminder to, to, to some colleagues: um, a, a grant is provided to local authorities with which to, to do public health activity. And this is a, a ring-fenced grant with a, a set of conditions attached. Now, uh, the, the majority of that grant does go towards our um, mandated services uh, that we, we commission. So that's sexual health services, um, NHS health checks, which is the cardiovascular disease risk assessment process, uh, public health nursing, which in includes health visiting and school nursing, so health visiting essentially naught to fives and school nursing uh, five onwards. And also um, a set of uh, what, what are often called lifestyle or behavior change services, such as smoking cessation, weight management. So they're largely the commission services. Um, and there's also the advice, as I mentioned, to uh, the NHS and also other uh, commissioners within the system. So, so you can see that there's, a, there's different aspects to public health. Um, and I, I, I think, it, it, as I say, the network is developing. We're working uh, across the Berkshire East system. Um, in terms of the local priorities, as Hema mentioned, and, and successes, I think um, COVID, as I, as I say, is, is a key success uh, throughout that time. And um, I know Hema has been actively involved in the um, supporting the Health and Wellbeing Board on the Health and Wellbeing uh, Strategy. Uh, which is largely focused on addressing health inequalities um, and the wider determinants of health. So we have a whole process in place around um, health in all policies, for example, which is an, uh, a process by which we want to ensure that everything the council does is focused on um, improving health and opportunities are taken. Um, and similarly with the ICB, there's a real opportunity to work with our NHS colleagues uh, to uh, make real progress on, on health inequalities. 
so, so that, that, that's a, a bit of an overview. Uh, I'm sure there may be questions, um, but if I, if I hand back to Hema, if that's Sorry. okay. Councillor Birch has a question, if you wouldn't mind at this moment. And Thank you. Councillor Mattock. Oh, yeah, sorry, Hima. Okay, yeah, that's it. So the 0 to 9 services are commissioned by public health, local public health, and we have health visitors as well as school nurses. We have increased the school nursing drop-ins into schools. Um, so that has continued because through COVID we realized that there was a need for it. And the response, we, because we did a survey with uh, users as well as schools, and that was one of the things they wanted. So we increased the drop-ins. And we are planning to retender next year because it's, the contract is coming to an end. And we are looking at it collectively or maybe individually, but we're exploring that because the workforce, again, in health visiting and school nurses is something which is... Um, as you know, across the country, there, there is a less, there's less workforce than needed. But we have, we've been very fortunate in Brighton Forest that we've had mixed skills and um, we are performing quite well on that. Thank you very much. Councillor Matta. Sorry, it, yes, it, it says that there's mail of 61,400 and 63,200. They don't say who. I assume they mean men, women, but it has been missed out. Yes, I will. Thank you. So coming to the first questions on emergency planning. So this is not about um, the hospital emergency. This is about the preparedness, the, the public protection. So we have the public protection policy, which does look at emergency planning. So that's, that's the function rather than the hospital emergency. Though emergency admissions as part of the healthcare advice, we do support in terms of looking at what are the causes, what are the things. And that's where, which I think Stuart was saying, as the new ICS is being formed, what are the priorities and how can we give them advice and support? So I think that those are the two different uh, aspects of emergency planning with people. known that you can no longer go to Brant's Bridge um, if you are ill. You have to go through 111 and your doctor. You can only go there direct if you've had an injury. And there's a lot of people who don't know that. And I, d I haven't really seen any publicity about it. So, oh, sorry, I thought I turned it off. So thank you for that, and I have made a note of that, and we'll take it back to our NHS colleagues and perhaps respond on that. Councillor Brossard, you had a question at this moment? Yes, thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much for that. Um, really, I, I think the first thing is, is to make a comment. I must say, I think the slide presentation, the PowerPoint presentation, is of a very high standard. I must say, anyone involved in producing PowerPoint packages knows the amount of work that has gone into it, and it's not a cut-and-paste job by any stretch of the imagination. 
Um, in some ways, my, my question follows on from Councillor Matic's question on the same page 20, and that's to do with life expectancy. Looking right at the last paragraph, why is there such a difference between Warfield at 88 plus years and Wild Ridings at 78 years? There's a variance of 10 years. Now then, two questions really. Is there also a breakdown available for some of the other parishes like Sandhurst, Crowthorne, Ascot? And if there is, I'd certainly be interested in seeing it. And secondly, why is there such a large variation? Is it smoking? Is it uh, alcohol? Is it obesity? Then, then someone must have gone into the reasons why in producing the figures. So thank you, Chairman. Thank you for raising that because that is a very interesting observation you made. So in terms of um, the life expectancy, there is difference because if you go back to the slide that we have got about health, a public health perspective, wider influences on our health and well-being, which has got that diagram about what are the wider influences on health and well-being, um, which tells us about how our health is impacted. We have obviously our own constitution in terms of our genetic and, um, can you hear me? I'm just making sure my, <laughs> yes. So in terms of our age, genetic uh, constitution and our uh, gender, but then there are the wider influences in terms of both lifestyle factors, in terms of, uh, and those lifestyle factors are affected by social and community networks, uh, the living and working conditions, housing access for goods and services, and then the wider socioeconomic. So, this all impacts, the wide influences on health actually impact life expectancy and people's, um, also the healthy life expectancy as disability free expect, uh, life expectancy. So in terms of, you ask why there's a wide difference, that's, those are the inequalities which are led by a number of things which are to do with deprivation, to do with you know, income, to do with how people live because of the influences in terms of where they, they are. So smoking cessation, obesity, all of these will impact but also we have to remember that some of the wider influences about where they live, what are the situations in the live are equally important in terms of some of those things. So yes, we have the, all the data and I have put a um, link over there in terms of the new Berkshire website, which has got all the data in terms of, you can, you can look around for different wards, but I'm really quite happy to send the life expectancy for all the wards to, through. Thank you. Councillor Temperton, you have a question? Yes, thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate, can you hear me? Yeah, you, I really appreciate the increase in school nursing because I'm a governor of a secondary school and I know how vital that is, especially with just having a face-to-face -face and listening. And I know parents have been invited to times for other consultations and it's been really, really positive. So that will continue with the other one though the how to five um, or even in schools from five upwards in schools in five upwards you do a lot of measuring with height and weight and do you get back individual if there's concern shown or if you notice anything or is it just this measuring is it just for statistical gain to show you what the general perception is and whether where the areas of inequality are because I know that sometimes when you watch a rugby match for instance and it's an inter schools rugby match you pick out some of our schools have very small children compared to the other kids that come on field and so I w is it just st um, statistical or do you go back to the individual parents or individual carers and say this needs to be looked at because there's concern here thank you so in terms of the first question, yes, we'll be continuing the school nursing drop-ins. The second one um, with the height and weight measurement, which is a national childhood measurement program, which is done by school nurses again in year six and uh, reception. There are two purposes there for that. One is to collect the statistics for surveillance of obesity, both nationally, regionally, and we also get local data in terms of whatever. So that's one function. But all the parents whose children have been measured get a letter giving the outcome of that uh, measurement and saying whether they are on the healthy weight range, they are underweight, they are overweight, but also they are signposted to the, the resources and also given the offer to phone or meet with the school nurses who then discusses with them. So that is the process, so it's both. And uh, we now have commissioned 
a children's weight management program. So we will also be referring and supporting them to access those which are, you know, a 12-week program, which is more about, not just about height and weight, but it's about uh, supporting the families, looking at both behavior insights, looking at the emotional side of things, because it's also the emotional side when we talk about height and weight. So yes, it is, it is follow-up as well. Thank you. That's really, really reassuring, actually. And can I just ask my other question that I did send in as well? And that okay, is about, about dental health, because who checks the dental health of our children? Because they are not going to dentists. There are hardly any national health dentists and their parents aren't going to dentists. And the st statistics of the number of children that had to go to hospital to have teeth sorted out last year are awful, and it doesn't look as if it's going to get any better. So does anyone check the health of our children's teeth? Please. So the health visitors do check oral health as part of the review. So they do check. Uh, so twice the oral health uh, is, is checked by health visitors. And if there are concerns, they will refer them to the appropriate. They also give advice on um, weaning and healthy diets, because that's one of the essentials in terms of oral health. And they also give out uh, toothpastes and toothbrushes, you know, which are relevant to that age group. There is, uh, there used to be a school survey to look at oral health in schools, which was again a national program. But for the last few years, a lot of local authorities have uh, not engaged in that. So therefore, if you're thinking about, you know, we, we used to get really good data in terms of the local schools and what the uh, looking at surveillance, that's not happening as good as it used to happen. Part of that is because it's not mandated. You know, you have to do something about the oral health. Um, part of it is because the way it was conducted previously and now has changed because they used to actually look at examine the teeth and say how many teeth are, um, what's the situation with, you know, DNTF and decayed and missed. Whereas now they, the, what they do is much lesser on that, so therefore it wasn't very effective. But we have commissioned in the last year and the years before so that we get an idea about where the oral health is poorer, which is an estimate, but then we can work in terms of with the schools. The other thing which we are doing, which we are looking at, which we didn't have, is a, a whole school approach to health and well-being. So my team now is looking at working with schools to look at a whole school approach using the school nurses and other to look at every aspect of health, but it's more a whole school approach rather than just doing individual targeted or, or fragmented um, reviews and fragmented interventions. Thank Mary, you. Did you want to come back, Mary? No, I think that's encouraging. And I just hope that more, more inspection of more teeth of more age groups takes place because I think um, it's going, uh, it, well, it affects their health later on in life. We all know that. And it's really important to get it sorted as early as possible. Thank you. Thank you. And I see Councillor Tina mackenzie Boyle, your hands up. Yes, so it is. Thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you, Stuart. And thank you, Mitha. Um, where we're looking at children and the problem of obesity, are we also monitoring those children who seem to be underweight? Because the lack of proper diet now will determine the rest of their lives, um, bone structure, etc. Are we doing that too? Yes, the, the children who are weighed do get, um, even if they're underweight, that is, the parents are supported to see what are the reasons why they're underweight. Uh, because there could be various reasons that they're underweight. But you're right that if they are underweight, that leads to later life um, problems. Generally speaking, what happens is, um, because it, it's, not, it's, it's not just about weight, sometimes both overweight and underweight, sometimes some children are more muscular and you will find they're overweight. So that's why it's important the school nurse has that discussion with the parents, assesses that, and if they are found to be underweight, then they will look at what, what can be done, whether it's a nutritional problem, whether it's something to do with the home environment, there could be a safeguarding issue. So those are the things which a health visit, a school nurses will pick up. And in terms of health visitors, they will also pick up because they weigh the children as well during the uh, reviews. Good. I'll echo Mary then and say that's encouraging. Thank you very much indeed. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Pima, uh, we interrupted. 
of birth, did you want more presentation? No, I'm fine. Thank you very much. So I think the rest, the rest of the slides were more about the health improvement function, which is very much sits within the local authority. And the health and well-being strategy kind of takes all of that on board. And I'm sure you all have seen the health and well-being strategy. If not, it's published. The delivery, because that's very important. You know, we have a strategy, but how do we deliver it? And the delivery of that is equally important. And we are taking the delivery plans for two of the priorities at the next Health and Wellbeing Board, which is on the 7th of September. So those are also available for everybody to look at. And if there are any comments, um, we definitely would like to you know, discuss that. But by December, we'll have the full, cost, you know, full delivery plan for the Health and Wellbeing Strategy, through which all the health improvement indicators will hopefully be looked at and progressed and quarterly reports to the Health and Wellbeing Board. So the Health and Wellbeing Board has this time set up a more robust governance for the delivery of the Health and Wellbeing Strategy. Thank you. Councillor Porter. Thank you, Chair. Um, I refer you to page 18 of the um, agenda regarding your budget. Um, my first question is, can you just give us an indication of, it says here, mandated 0-5 children's services and all other 0-5 children's services. Some are prescribed functions and some are non-prescribed functions. Can you just give us an idea of what prescribed functions would actually take place? In terms of prescribed functions are the health visiting. So health visiting is a prescribed function where they have, there is guidance in terms of the framework of what health visitors should be doing because it's, it's part of that uh, prescribed function. A new guidance has just come out, uh, which is slightly different from the previous one where one of the things that we have looked at as part of looking at the data and, and with stakeholder, st stakeholders is a three-month review, a follow-on three-month review is very important. You know, everybody has said that, yes, we have all this, but an extra review of children at three months is important because prior to that, the mother is, especially in, in case of new mother, is busy with, you know, just getting to know the child. But at three months, they will be more settled, so it will be better to do a three-month review. So the health visiting is a prescribed service. In terms of non-prescribed is everything else we do for children and young people. So, for example, the whole school approach that we are taking is a non-prescribed. The uh, childhood weight management services that we've commissioned is a non-prescribed. It's not mandated. Public mental health, so children's emotional and well-being, anything we do is non-prescribed. But that is the gift within our remit in terms of what our priorities are, what we as locally want to do. So that's, those are the two areas of um, prescribed and non-prescribed. Thank you. Uh, just following on though, uh, we mentioned about obesity uh, and it says in your report that one in four children, one in four children in reception year and one in three children in year six are overweight, including obese. Uh, percentage of adults overweight who are obese is 63.5%. Proportion of adults who are physically inactive is 22%. Um, but then looking at your budget, you're only spending um, £104,000 on obesity. So it seems quite low, and yet the line above it, public health advice to NHS commissioners, is 125000 So what's more important, trying to deal with obesity or um, giving advice to NHS commissioners? Um, and my... my real question is um, what is actually doing to try and counter obesity because obviously that leads to other problems for people um, and you've got here um, public mental health so that's again would affect people's mental health uh, and it also puts a lot of pressure on our NHS so why is the budget so low in dealing with obesity? Thank you for that question, and I think it's a very important question you raised. Um, so in terms of the public health advice, that's a mandated, so we have to do that, and that's the 120K. However, what we have done is looked at um, the budget and said, what else, what do we need to spend on, on obesity? So there are three things that we have, three or four things that we have done and we are commissioning, and that 
isn't included in this budget because this was last year's previous spend. So obviously it will be now coming in the next spend, we'll see increased um, amount in terms of it. So the three things we've done is we have commissioned uh, adult weight management program, which is actually over-prescribed because we had commissioned in the first year for around 500 people to go through the service. Within the two quarters, sec second quarter, we had 600 waiting list. So obviously there's a demand and we have increased them. So we have spoken to the providers to increase the capacity. We have just rewarded children and young people's weight management program. So the children who are already obese can be supported and the families can be supported to change their lifestyle and improve their weight. The third thing that we have commissioned and we have commissioned Southampton University to work with us to look at a whole system approach to obesity. And that's in the slide. Because obesity, as you know, has again very complex. There are various wider influences. And unless we work as a whole system, we cannot target, we cannot do anything about it. So the whole system approach, which we had the first meeting, which was chaired by Councillor Dale Birch, was about looking at all the stakeholders. It's got six things, including you know, the reason why we commissioned Southampton University, because that was the only tender which showed that they would work with retailers and businesses, and they have the, uh, the uh, experience of working with them. So the idea is to bring all, everybody together to look at what are the key approaches we can take in Brackner Forest to target some of the things and some of the interventions, which are what do we need to do as a system, as a whole borough, to tackle obesity. Because it cannot be done either by just by NHS or by local authority, but it has to be everybody's business to tackle obesity. Thank you for those responses. Thank you. Stuart, did you want to come in at this stage on this particular point? Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, really, really just, just to add to, to what Hema's just said, um, I, I, suppose, I suppose the, um, the thing to emphasise is the public health grant is a, is, a, is a relatively small amount in, in terms of the whole system. Um, and as I mentioned, there, there are a set of grant conditions and some must do. So we, we must spend it on particular service, uh, uh, services, for example, which, which takes up you know, a significant amount of the grant. And as Hema mentioned, um, tackling an issue like obesity, which, which is a rising tide, you know, there is, there is a, a national issue with obesity, uh, childhood obesity in particular, um, that is a whole system response. And so it, it, public health, one of the, one of the um, aims of public health is to try and bring people together to focus on particular issues. And obesity clearly is, isn't just about providing treatment services to people who may be already overweight. It's also about the primary prevention and encouraging people and supporting people to take up more physical activity, whether that's walking to the shops rather than, rather than driving or um, promoting active travel by um, providing cycle networks, that, that sort of thing. So, so it's definitely a, a whole uh, range of issues. And, uh, and also, if we think about the cost of living crisis um, currently and the coming winter, it may be um, uh, difficult for, for some families to, to, to cope, and obviously the, the cheaper foods may not be the most healthy ones. Uh, so so it's, it's absolutely a whole, whole um, system approach, which he has mentioned. Thank you. Um, I see Mary, your hand's up. Is that an older hand, or is that another question? This is another question. It follows on directly from Stuart, actually, because... One of the priorities in your in the slide you showed us was warm homes and food security. So they're listed as priorities for this winter, warm homes and food security. So what will be done by um, in public health for, for, to prioritise warm homes and food security? And how will the outcomes be measured of what you've managed to put in place, please? So there are two things that um, I just want to reply to. So I just wanted to mention very quickly before we move on to your question is um, the health and health policy is part of the, the whole system approach to obesity is part of health and health policy. And it, one of the slides we have said is what we are doing in health and health policy, which is looking at procurement, which is looking at um, all the policies we make and the impact of health. So hopefully that also will look at obesity as an issue. In terms of the question on warm homes and um, food security. The reason we thought that this is a priority and we need to include that in our winter planning 
Normally, winter planning has always include uh, things like vaccination, discharges, which is fine, but in terms of a population approach, obviously food security and warm health in particular this year is going to be very important. We have started working with, we give some budget to um, warm holes, the head of the welfare system, you know, the welfare and they do the warm homes, which includes anybody um, who needs to pay for any essentials. So we do that, but we are working with them and housing and others to look at what can be done especially those who are on low income, to look at what impact it will have in terms of the high electricity. Their government is hopefully when they do announce some of the things, we're waiting for that. How do we ensure people are accessing that and how do we help people to access some of those grants and things? The other thing that we have been thinking about is, and this is again, you know, we are exploring with uh, our colleagues uh, around the council and uh, partners in, in our voluntary sector, is, and this is something which, uh, sometimes is hidden is there are many people who are living in houses which are big um, the children have grown up and left they are on pensions so they are asset rich but cash poor and sometimes and I don't, we do, I don't know the stock I'm um, new to um, Bracknell Forest the stock in Bracknell Forest and are the areas where perhaps there are older people who perhaps don't fall under that low income, but they have, they, we need to support them in terms, they have health conditions and therefore we need to support them more. So these are the things we're exploring to look at before people reach crisis, what can we do to identify and support people and what needs to be done? So I can't give you a right answer now, but I'm hoping I can come back with this in terms of what we have, we can put in place. In terms of food security, we are in discussion with the food banks and we have looked at what is happening in other areas. And Stuart men mentioned about fresh, you know, fresh fruit, vegetables, which are quite important for a nutritional diet. And there are areas which have looked at um, any fruits and vegetables or anything that are produced by people who are on allotments, any excess. Retail markets who've got excess food and vegetables. How do you work with them to ensure that the food banks get that delivered so that people can have fresh food? There are also examples of food share in Wokingham, for example, where people, irrespective of whether they go for the food bank, have bought stuff which they now feel they're not going to eat in time. So there's still plenty of time in terms of it to be, it's not used by date, it's still plenty of time. But rather than wasting it, there's a food share center where they go and provide that. And a lot of, in Wokingham, there's a lot of centers which do food share, which is working very well. That also has impact on food waste. So we need to look at that. And the third thing is about food larder. Um, the food larders are obviously where there are um, fridges supplied. And one of the things we've been looking at is silver homes and seeing whether they have any space and are they looking at having uh, a food larder. We also have been uh, looking at some other interventions which proved to be, which have shown in other places to work. So we are working on that to see how we can improve the, when we say about food security, it's not only the amount of food, but it's the quality of food and the diet. So we are looking at those to see how we can support those who perhaps may be less fortunate and may have to think about, do we eat or do we heat? Uh, Councillor Tina McKenzie Ball, is that a new hand, Tina? Absolutely a new hand, Chairman. Right. Thank you. Please carry on. Okay. Um, a warm hub. Have you heard of this, this, this initiative where warm hubs have been created um, as places within the local community where people can be assured of finding a safe, warm and friendly environment which to en enjoy refreshment, social activity? Is BFC taking part in this? Have you heard of it, these warm hubs? Or a warm bank, as some of them councils uh, are calling them? No, thank you very much. I had not heard of it. As part of our in, uh, social isolation um, work, we are looking at using, we've been mapping the centers and you know across the borough to look at where we can start doing some of that work. Not, I didn't think about the warm hub, but where people can go in, have a chat with somebody, have a coffee, and especially our social prescribing team are doing a lot of that in terms of where they can start going. They're already going to some centers. So thank you very much for you know that information. And one of the things for bringing, putting this 
on the agenda, the, the wormholes and food securities, is we have started to look at it. And I'm, as I find, you know, whenever I have my meeting with Councillor Dale Birch, he's always got some insights. So I'm hoping, you know, some of the insights that you can help us with this would be very welcome. Okay. Can, uh, can, can, I, can I just say about the warm bank? Apparently, as, a warm, as opposed to a warm hub, where we um, ensure that people will not be alone in there are times when there is a certain amount of deprivation, shall we say. Um, a warm bank. More councils, apparently, have signalled using churches, community centres um, as so-called warm banks for people to, who are unable to afford to, to heat their own homes this winter. Would we be thinking as a council, as a community, to um, help in this way? It's interesting you have mentioned that because, in fact, only yesterday I was discussing with my team and we didn't call it warm banks, but what we were looking at is, are there places where perhaps people can, there, there is a kitchen where we can prepare food so people can come in and have the food, but also at the same time, talk to people, also at the same time, learn some of the cooking skills if they don't have, is how to cook on, on, a, on a budget. And some of the things that are happening in other places, as you said, is especially for the younger generation, is about how do you bulk, you know, if you've got something, how do you use it properly? So we have been, in fact, discussing that. And one of the areas that my team mentioned was one of the colleges has got a kitchen because they teach catering students, which a lot mm -hmm. of them is available. So yes, that, that's a very interesting thing. And how do we do that um, with perhaps one of the yeah. colleges or other centers, yes. Sure, and should us parishes um, be looking at back as well? Um, as each parish, say mm. Crowthorne, Sandhurst, Winkfield, whatever, we could um, provide, our, uh, provide our own warm hub, mm -hmm. warm bank, couldn't we? We could do that. Can I come in here as Councillor Mr. Her Mrs. Hayes, Chairman, is to follow on from exactly what Mrs. Uh, Mackenzie Boyle was talking about. It's not a warm hub or a warm bank. It's actually um, other parts of the current country and I've actually been looking at it myself at libraries because mm -hmm. we keep a library open and we are insulating in last night's meeting expenditure was solar paneling for heating was being put onto this and I've actually been into my own parish and other um, how can I put it older persons homes uh, and, and talking with them to not have them worry about their heat in this year and to go to such places as libraries and that is something uh, I think it's communication we've got to get out there okay it is communication okay that's that's okay. great maybe so we are... something we should be bringing up under climate change advisory Panel. Yeah, we could we could do that as chairman, as the uh, vice chairman of that. I will make and sure I will that we'll bring does. it up as the executive. Yeah, member. but I would like actually to go back. To, we've got a parish council meeting on Tuesday, and I would like to have absolutely from out in the nicest possible way our horse's mouth here. What do we do as a parish? Can we provide such things? Uh, maybe the library. Yes, we've got at the parish hall, the Morgan. I mean that we would be encouraging people to come and keep warm and have good food in our areas. How can we encourage other er uh, other people in, in in our parishes? So what we need to do is BFC to spearhead this and say, this as a council, this is what we're doing. And so there we are, right at the top. And we've got little tendrils underneath all the parishes, and we go into BFC. It's like a, it's a, pro a it project, a project plan, shall we say? I'm sure Hema, you'll pick that up. You? Yes, we would welcome that opportunity because, as part of all the centres, parish councils are something which we did look at. Libraries are another centres which we, and we would really welcome to have that dialogue and how we work and together in that. Definitely. That, that, would, that would be fantastic. And. Perhaps we could invite you can come to talk to us at our pa parish council meeting in October. Yep, Just, definitely. That would be lovely. Thank you so yeah. much. I appreciate your time and your help here. Thank you. Thank you. Well done, Tina. Crafty invite. Um, oh, Mary, yes. Mary, would oh, you yes. like to uh, have another yeah, question? There, it, there's, there's very good apps around. I was on in Great Holland. I saw a load of fruit outside and vegetables outside a house. I thought it was a delivery that was been there all day but it wasn't 
it's an app called Olio, and you go to the different stores and you pick it up and you put it outside your house. And on this app, anybody can join it and they, they know what's available in which day locations within their scene of them and use it on oh, Great Holland to do this. And the, after the sell by date, they take it to a local farmer to sit to give to his animals. So it's fantastic for stopping food waste. But it's really a lot of people are using it. Hundreds of families are going there who have not got the vouchers to go to food banks. So uh, some more fresh vegetables or bread or whatever given out by all the all the for, by a lot of our supermarkets to be collected by these people in these locations where everybody knows because they've got the app and they can download it. It's a really good system and I'm advertising it on Great Honors Matters and I think it would be if other people promoted it so that food security was better for a lot of people this winter. And I've already started looking at Great Holland's as a warm afternoons. Thank you. OK, thank you, Mary. Uh, Hema, I think that's another one. Perhaps uh, this is a two way conversation tonight of learning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and that's good uh, because, as I said, you know, public health alone can't do things. So we really welcome that. I, we would definitely work with you on that. Thank you, Chairman. Um, actually, I'm going to go also because I'm very keen on um, the under fives. You know, we have, we're, we're very fortunate that we still have children's centres. So it might be that's another avenue because I think that young families are going to find it very tough. Um, you know, it, it's really expensive having babies and having young children under five. And perhaps that's another way of reaching out. And I think that's, that's really important. That's just an add-on to that, but my real question, if I may, Chair, I'm on page 22, 23, and um, one of the things that really concerns me, and which you've actually um, highlighted here, is the emotional well-being of our young people. And I find it really interesting that the look, children that are looked after and um, the hospital admissions, you know, that one, is that under 18, is that really up a lot? Because it doesn't give any reference. But is it a huge increase? Can you just talk about that? And on the next, you know, it's it's really important that we actually focus on this. Because I, I, I myself have been doing a report about SEND and about the emotional well-being of our young people. And the increase has been huge. Um, so I'm just interested in what you're going to do about that. So this is one of our priorities in the health and well-being strategy. So one of the priorities, both in terms of the starting well, emotional health, as well as priority two, which is about supporting those who already have. And within the health and well-being strategy, um, we have come together as partners, the NHS, voluntary sector, and others, to look at what can be done, both in terms, and there are something like, I think, 10 outcomes we're looking at and 10 key actions. Um, so what perhaps would be useful is to look at that delivery plan and action plan for those two priorities, and we can perhaps discuss this further. But the key thing that starting well at a young age is a lot of parents, as you said, you know, sometimes themselves are feeling low, mm. and we have been working with Homestart to look at how we support new parents and any parents who are feeling low, or working with health visitors, who health visitors can signpost them to Homestart, and Homestart have started a lot of groups. So from the funding we have provided, they have started a lot of groups for mothers, young mothers, including walking, healthy walks, et cetera, to support them. The other bit is where um, when children start going to school, we have now got mental health support teams in some schools, but we our view is that they should be provided to all schools, primary and secondary schools, in terms of supporting children with their emotional health, recognizing, and the whole school, including teachers and those who are supporting children, being aware of what it is about emotional health and how do they support resilience in young children. And then there will be the more targeted, you know, where we know there are issues with, especially in terms of families, what can we do with those who are 
uh, in that situation where they may need more targeted interventions working with both the ICS as well as the, um, uh, the family hubs. So our health visitors, as you know, are placed in family hub, so they can pick that up and we can do all of that. So there is quite a lot that we need to do, uh, and it will take some time to deliver everything, but we have made a good start in terms of committing ourselves to doing some of the key actions that we need to do to look at right from the very early age in terms of supporting emotional health to then later when children do develop some, if they do develop some mental health issues or behavioral problems, how do we support the families to understand and support that child? So that's the approach we are taking. Thank you. Um, I think it's such a key area and thank you for that answer. One thing that has come up and that we found is actual therapies, um, play therapies and art therapies and different types of therapies for particularly teenagers. Um, there doesn't seem to be a real wealth of it. Um, so I wonder if you have a sort of focus on that. Yes, thank you for reminding me about that. So our community map, which is the assets of every, all the activities that go on, because of COVID, obviously, we didn't know what was going on. So we just re looked at um, revalidating. So the team has actually found every activity, every social group that was on community map to see if they're still going on and whether they're new maps. So we just looked at that and we got that. In addition, we are working with stakeholders in terms of we've got a new platform, which is easier to use, looking at what it is um, which will help them. So it's all frontline workers who can look at the community map and support. And we did, uh, we did identify that you know, this is a gap, especially for children and young people. And our young champions also had the same feedback. Is they don't want to talk about mental health, but they don't want to talk about creative activities, physical activities. So one of the things which one of my members, Catherine Davis, who is the children and young people's lead, and she leads on the children, uh, young uh, champions, is looking at how do we increase that, working with, uh, with schools and other organizations outside schools to increase the activities outside schools. So we're saying schools they have, but outside schools, what is it we can do, not only to create more activities, but also peer support through those activities. So those are two, again, work programs that we have started in terms of looking at um, the community map and where the gaps are. So Catherine is, is working on that. Our social prescribers at the moment are only working with adult, so 18 plus, and they have been, as part of their work, they also have been starting up some groups. So there's one group started with Silva Homes. But again, that's a gap that we have social prescribers for adults, but we don't have anything similar where people can talk about. And again, that's something which we are talking with voluntary sector and Kuth and others, um, sport in mind. Sport in mind used to do only 18 plus sports, for, but now they're also going to do for younger people. Thank you. Are there any other questions at the moment? I think, I think quite clearly, um, it's been very interesting learning in depth more about your side our learning of public health, because I'm sure we all think we know what it means, but uh, we can see that there's a lot more to it. I I'm wondering whether perhaps you would be so kind as sometime in the future come back again and then we can talk further and you can update us with some of the activities that you're, you're starting out on now. Um, would members like that to, to happen? I mean. We won't make it immediately, but we'll plan it in if, if you're willing, you're agreeing. Okay, sure. Chairman, I did send in a question about a wellbeing pamphlet. I don't know whether you had an answer or whether you'd had time to look at, look at it. And I sent the email to you yeah. that the resident had sent me. So I didn't know whether you had an answer to that question. Yeah. So I, I did find out about the pamphlet and who, you know, where it was sent from. So the, our com the council communications team have been doing this during COVID. So it was, it was funded through COMF, where they were sending well-being um, pamphlets. And that was funded by, um, by COMF. We also have the health improvement 
pamphlet. And now we are looking at, in terms of since COVID has going back to business, is what is it that we need to do in terms of sending health and well-being um, pamphlets. One of the, the email that was forwarded is about the resident was, the information on that is that there are very rare, serious adverse reactions to vaccinations. And um, that is very true. Serious reactions are rare. So I've looked at the data in terms of the data produced on safety. And as you know that if somebody has an adverse reaction, they fill in a yellow card. So I've looked at the number of doses and the number of yellow cards being produced, um, which were reported. Um, and we have to remember a yellow card doesn't necessarily mean it was a serious adverse reaction. This is where somebody felt that. So when the analysis was done uh, on this nationally and they looked at the data, most of the reports were very mild and minor reactions, adverse reactions. So for example, if somebody had an injection and then they had a sore arm, they were uh, flu-like symptoms, you know, headache, a little bit cold. So most of them were very mild. Where they were, um, where we know that they, they were serious adverse reactions, they were very low. So I've got some figures which I'm quite happy to circulate. So the, the reports, if you look at based on how many numbers of uh, doses were given, there were something like two to five reports per thousand. And then when you start looking at the adverse reactions, they go down for a million doses, which are very small. The main um, adverse reactions were obviously anaphylactic shock. Um, and the advice given was that when somebody goes that, and if they've had any allergy to any of the components of a vaccination in Pfizer, then obviously they, 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 they would not be given that vaccination. So they were, uh, once that advice was given, um, they, they were looked after. And, and the Moderna, I think they said that if somebody has, got, has had an anaphylactic or any allergy reaction, they shouldn't be given Moderna. So I think there were things in place for the safety in terms of that, and that, that obviously therefore has worked. Then there's some, one of the key um, concerns has been about uh, heart inflammation, pericarditis and myocarditis, as well as uh, thrombos, clots, blood clots. And when you look at the data, again, the data shows that it was, it, the incidence of these, and it's again very difficult, although it's very difficult to look at some of this, after the first dose and second dose, they have in, uh, analyzed all of those, and those again has been said that they were rare, they were not very, so if you look at the benefits of vaccination against these rare conditions, then obviously the benefits outweigh. Uh, but no, obviously it's not foolproof, but the, I think the information in terms of that it is rare was correct. Yes, there were adverse reactions, but rare adverse reactions were rare. Thank you, thank you very much. I really um, was just interested to, to give a reply to this resident uh, and to explain, you know, exactly. I didn't want to do it uninformed, and I just thought as it was a, you know, you were here today, that was really useful. And did we pay this through public health? Did we pay for this pamphlet or not? So this was through the... This was through the money we got for COVID. So it wasn't from the public health grant. So again, the COVID money that we get is, there are conditions on what we can and we can't spend on. Um, and I think what I was told, is it was like 27 pence per booklet. Thank you. I've got to actually put some balance here. I have had people say how wonderful it is, but because I actually had an email, I just wanted, uh, you know, something to reply back. Um, and I just thought it was interesting. Can I ask, I've had it in my ward, which is Hamworth and Birch Hill, but I didn't have one myself in Sandhurst. Did it go the whole borough or not? So according to the comms team, it did, they did use a, a the same service which should be going out to all households. And I have mentioned to them that it doesn't seem like it's gone out to all households, so they need to check on the provider who's been doing that. Thank you very much. Thank okay, much. right, thank you. Jill, um, again, can I thank you very much, Stuart and Hema, for coming along to us this evening. And we look forward to seeing you sometime in the future. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you.
I also am very, I think I, I should thank you for the engagement which I have felt through this. Okay, members, then we move on to item seven, which is the council plan overview report. Um, now, I don't know who's, who's presenting this. Anybody? That would be me, Chairman. Ah, sorry, didn't see you there. Thank you. Hello, Stuart. That's all right, Chairman. I'm not in the chamber, so apologies. I'm not immediately obvious. So, um, good evening, Chairman. Good evening, members. So, uh, this is the, the regular quarterly overview report that sets out delivery against the council plan priorities. So, there's lots of detail in the report. Um, I'm happy to take some questions on it, but before we get there, I'll just highlight a number of key um, issues which happened during the, the first quarter of this year. So, um, it, it was the start of the, the period when which we had to start to deal with uh, a large number of people coming from Ukraine as a result of the conflict there. So through the, the family visa scheme and the Homes for Ukraine scheme, by the end of quarter one, we had um, received, received in Bratton Forest 82 guests and another 71 are expected. And I think most have now arrived by, by this moment in time. So it, it's going to continue to have an impact clearly as long as the, the conflict continues. Um, the Probably the highlight from the Council's perspective in the, the first quarter was the Ofsted inspection under the ILAX framework, which took place in early June. We didn't get the, the results until quarter two, but the, the, the inspection took place in quarter one. And I'm delighted to be able to report that we received an, an outstanding rating. So that was absolutely unexpected and a fantastic result, particularly given the context of the, the COVID pandemic. So a, a huge congratulations to the Children's Social Care team for, for that achievement. Another achievement, uh, which goes, uh, I think, largely to, to Hazel Hill, our energy officer, was that we were awarded as Local Authority of the Year in the South East Regional Energy Efficiency Awards. So there's details in the report around the, the, the issues which led to that, but we did support almost 700 households to improve their uh, fuel efficiency rating of their properties. And clearly that's a, a really important thing to, to do in this current climate. So in, uh, looking internally more within the borough, then we, we did refresh the council's values. Uh, we moved away from the, the forward acronym, which was um, a, a bit difficult, I think, for, for many people to remember towards a much more simple, inclusive, ambitious and always learning approach. And that, that is felt to really sum up the, the approach that we are trying to work towards within Brighton Forest Council. We do achieve it the vast majority of the time, but clearly that's uh, an ambition to, to constantly achieve that, look, looking ahead, those three ambitions. Um, the, the final bit which I, I have to mention was around the, the less post development, which is that we did have to publish a written statement of action as a result of the, the SEND inspection which took place last year. So the, the, the positive element of it was that Ofsted recognised that we had taken on board all the comments they'd raised. Our action plan did address all of them and they were confident that it would deliver. So therefore they were happy to approve that action plan without further amendments. So that, that's all by way of introduction, Chairman, but very happy to, to move to questions that members may have. Thank you, Stuart. Um, members, I think perhaps what we'll do with this is, is just to work through page by page, which will give you the opportunity to pick up on the items that you would have flagged up and want to ask a question on. Um, so I think if we notably start what, page 43 on my papers is the beginning. Does anybody have any any questions there? No. Okay, then we can we go on to uh, page forty four. Um, there's a paragraph there, overview of quarter one and highlights. Can I just say first of all, this is the closest we've ever got to seeing the CPOR for the actual time frame that it covers. Now we we've, we've been trying to get closer, as you know. And uh, this is the closest that we've come. So, you know, it is much, much improved information to us. Um, the question I'd like to ask under 2.2, staff continue to work mostly from home, Stuart. What are the future plans on that as an authority? Well, we have adopted a flexible working policy, which means that we have a normal expectation that staff may work in the office for one or two days a week. 
and we'll work at home for, for the rest of that time. Now, clearly, while COVID is still fairly prevalent in the community, we're, we're um, still working to that, but not actively encouraging staff to move back in. So it's very, very flexible at this moment in time, but we expect that gradually um, individuals will start to move back to the office. I think the social care teams are um, pretty much back to how they were working previously pre-pandemic. Other teams that are in the council are probably still working more from home than, than in the office. So it's a little bit of a, um, a, a fl very flexible approach at this moment, but we do expect that to change gradually over time, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Sure, uh, on the same page, page 44, um, item 2.3, uh, Homes for the Ukrainians. Uh, there's been quite a bit in the press recently about um, when the scheme ends uh, that there might be a lot of families present themselves as homeless. So are there any provisions um, f for future provisions if such things happen? Uh, yeah, the, the council is working with the, the hosts who have already come forward uh, and with the individuals who, who, who are engaged with them to understand um, which of them may wish to continue with the placements at the end of the period and which of them may wish to, um, to terminate those. And we have a working arrangement in place which will look at those who have come forward as uh, identifying as wishing to be hosts who aren't currently hosts. So the, in the first instance, it's about trying to match the, the guests with the, the potential hosts from those who haven't yet taken on anyone. But you know we, we are seeing the occasional instance of homelessness when the, the placements break down, as are all other councils across the country. I'm afraid I've got some comments. Um, on item 2.5, um, I live on Wild Ridings, I've lived there for a long time and I've been long associated with Heathlands as it used to be. I was certainly at the opening and I go regularly because I know people are in there as well as people who have family in there too. I was woken up the other morning at 20 past seven with a phone call from a, a colleague of mine to say, have I seen what was on um, the um, Bracknell News online? And it was all about what it, um, it, you know, the bad CQC report on Heathlands. Um, I didn't, I didn't know it was on tonight, and because I only had my papers to uh, to my hand yesterday, so I've been doing a bit of homework. Okay, I hope you'll bear with me. Um, I gather that this CQC me um, inspection took o place over a weekend when the technical staff are not usually there because there's, they have a lot more visitors there because being the weekend they visit their friends. Um, so I've been quite disturbed about a number of things. I'm not saying it's perfect um, and there have been things wrong. However, um, I do know that um, the, there was criticism about the no che uh, checking for Legionnaire's disease Actually, there was a full report which was locked in a cupboard, but the um, maintenance man wasn't there and nobody asked for it, so they didn't see it. And it is in existence in full and entirety, and it does conform with all the legislation. There's also criticism about the activities that are going on. Again, uh, the a person who was doing the activities and the new one started a week later, um, the folders were locked away in a cupboard because they don't do very much activities at weekends because of the visitors and families, etc. Again, nobody asked to see them. They weren't looked at. So it's really quite worrying, I think. Um, also, um, I, I believe that there was a door handle came off, probably, possibly over the weekend, on the Friday. The maintenance man will too. He didn't know about this report about the CQC. He came in, he saw it, and he, he put the handle straight back on. So that was a criticism, but it wasn't, as I say, mentioned to him. Um, there's also the um, pull button alarms, which were tied up, and there was criticism about that. <coughs> well, apparently they didn't know that they could, shouldn't be tied up, but I know that they were safety checked and everything was given the okay on them. So I think there's does some, you know, needs to be some looking into this because um, 
it, things aren't, in, I'm not saying they're good, but there's things which are, were there in place already which they are being criticised for. I do go down there a lot. Um, if I were, were able to walk fast, I'd be there in two minutes. I literally live that close to it. And I do and I do go in frequently. So I hope you'll bear that in mind because I really am disappointed what happened. And particularly doing the CQC meet, um, inspection over a weekend is a bit unusual, I would have thought. Thank you. Any response, Stuart? I think that counts more as an observation than a question, Chairman. However, there was a, a written question raised around Heathlands and uh, a response has been provided by Tom Wilson, the Assistant Director for Commissioning. Um, you know, and, and in response to um, Councillor Matic's point, yes, it's, it's often the case that CQC inspections pick up um, things which, which prove afterwards not to be quite accurate. However, I think it's important to recognise that the CQC inspection did happen because the, the council staff were flagging some concerns about the the operation of the, the facility. So, you know, they, they were deliberately engaged and brought on board and that has led to the, the council working very closely with the, the provider to make sure that the concerns which are raised are being addressed. Uh, we do know that... Um, the, the care provider have engaged some some new staff from a very specialist agency who are making very positive inroads, but but it still requires quite a lot of work to to turn around all of the issues which were flagged before the reinspection in October. But the the focus is on um, supporting the the provider to do that. And thank you for that. I, and I do know some people there, and they did make um, complaints about it. So I am aware there was justification for some of it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Two point eight. Yeah. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, Stuart. Two point eight. Um, I'd just like to endorse your comments uh, in congratulating um, Hazel Hill for her award and um, helping to get over seven hundred households that were fuel inefficient um, insulated. On continuing the good work, especially in these times when fuel costs are rising considerably. So, um, again, it would be nice to pass on our congratulations to Hazel, um, and I certainly will do that on a serious basis. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Councillor. In some ways, following on from what the question that Councillor Porter raised, are we looking at those residents who actually? draw their energy or their, their, their fuel through oil because we are aware that the government grant of £400 does not apply to those people who've got oil central heating. So I know that I think Santa School, their system is being replaced, I believe a new boiler is being put in to replace the oil fired boiler. Are we doing anything with the resident canals uh, with regard to installing either LPG or a gas supply to those who currently have got oil? It, it's a very detailed question, I'm afraid, Chairman, which I'm, I'm not in a position to answer. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, Kevin Gibbs, who's on the call, may have some more awareness of it, but I think we may have to go back to uh, to ask the, the officers more closely involved around this. Uh, yes, Chair, I can, I can give uh, a, a general answer to that, but not specific. Uh, obviously, uh, the work that Hazy Hill's been doing is under a government scheme for looking at inefficient uh, properties. And we look at the energy rate into properties and then uh, look to see what we can do to improve the efficiency of that building. Uh, we have been just awarded another grant of just over a million pounds for that work. So I don't think we look in terms of the fuel being used in the building, but more the energy rating of that building. But uh, that scheme is challenged on the basis that I think pretty much everyone in the southeast is trying to do exactly the same piece of work. But actually, the uh, uh, this provider market isn't able to keep up with the demand. So uh, certainly where we've looked at uh, our own buildings, we've brought forward schemes to make those more efficient from a carbon use, uh, carbon use uh, but also the work we've been doing in the community has been about looking at our least inefficient buildings 
whether they're in our ownership or in the community ownership and then looking to see what we can do to improve that. So we do have a scheme around that, but I don't have the absolute detail uh, to answer that question about oil field or, or uh, what, what fuel supply those buildings are being used under. Thank you, Kevin. Moving on then to page 46. I think, if I may, I, um, it's not to be negative, but the paragraph 3.2, which talks about the special educational needs and disability services, focus priority to develop a written statement of action, uh, which was done and was submitted to Ofsted in June and accepted without the need for any further amendments. I, I think that's to be congratulated. We sometimes yes, Chairman, I, I, I did highlight that. That is, um, you know, that the position we were in with ACND is is not a good one, but the the response that we've taken to it, I think, is uh, exemplary. Moving on to page forty-seven. Stop me now, because. Yeah. You may not w have. Would you like me just to, to, to comment on this generally, Chairman, around the, the financial position rather than well, all the detail that's in no, there? No, let's so, just go right right through it. We'll, we'll go through the pages yeah. and just see what questions members have identified first. Um, so page 47, 48, 49, 50, 51. Um, on page 51, uh, one, two, three, four down from the top, Stuart, 1.0107, delivery of business change savings. Uh, the comment is progress is currently being reviewed. Can you tell us anything about that? Yeah, the members may be aware that the, the business change programme has recently been reframed to uh, encompass not just transformation savings, it also looks at uh, service improvement areas, uh, major legislative challenges such as the, the social care reforms, as well as uh, initiatives to, to save money to become more efficient. So we, we have populated the programme initially with a number of different uh, schemes and projects. The the current work that's going on is to quantify the potential savings of the ones which are expected to drive efficiency. So that's the stage we're at at this moment, and that work will be firmed up over the autumn, Chairman. Are we happy with the 25% progress at this stage? As a Section 151 officer, Chairman, I'd, much, I'd be much happier if we were 100% progress, but realistically, it, it is a journey. You cannot change the whole organisation uh, overnight, and we do have to recognise that, you know, dealing with major legislative change such as the social care reforms is something that is going to take a lot of organisational capacity. So it's just a recognition, I think, that there is only so much that, that we can do at one time. So progress is being made, um, and it will continue to be made, but probably 25% of where we need to be is about accurate in terms of savings at this time. Okay, thank you, Stuart. Um, can we just go back to page 49, Councillor Porter, have a question? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Sorry about that. I need to wake up. Um, Stuart, um, on the um, significant variances uh, regarding delivery, uh, and this relates to the waste collection. So uh, does our contract, uh, are they able to put up their prices due to the fuel costs? And in particular to um, the recent uh, settlement that happened today at the uh, Windsor and Maidenhead, whereby the waste collection staff were given a significant pay rise. So does that come under our pressures or the waste collection company or its sewage? That, that, that's a very good question, um, Councillor. I would look to bring in Kevin Gibbs at this point, if that's possible. Thank you, Chair. So in terms of the... Um, Suez contract, uh, we recognise that fuel costs have gone up and we're sharing that that, that burden um, as, as it would be unfair of us to simply expect our supplier to pick up all of those costs. In terms of our um, uh, waste disposal contract, uh, there, there's actually more leverage to have a, a different conversation about how inflation, and particularly fuel cost inflation, affects that business. 
Um, and so uh, myself and my colleagues across the three other authorities are entering into uh, a discussion with our provider to see what options are available in terms of uh, mitigating the inflationary pressures that we're all facing. Yeah, Kevin, thanks for that. But following on from that, I know Windsor and Maidenhead have a problem, and there's certainly a problem in Scotland with waste not being collected. So can you give us an assurance that, you know, everything will be done to ensure that, you know, the, this council gives support to sewers if they need it and help them with the inflationary pressures? Uh, Chair, I'm, I'm happy to give that assurance. Um, we have an a, a incredibly great, uh, good relationship with Suez. Uh, it really does work as a partnership rather than as a contract. Uh, we work on a very open book uh, approach. Uh, and I can see that Councillor Hayes is about to come in and say that she monitors that contract and that relationship incredibly closely. Uh, I think one, one of our concerns would be about the... Um, consolidation of the waste collection marketplace. There are a number of big uh, organisations, um, increasingly fewer big organisations, which are now uh, uh, not only collecting the waste on the streets, but actually doing the process in the back end. Um, our concern would have been if we had been swallowed up by certain providers, because I think those are the ones which have been challenged with industrial relations issues. Uh, we're, we're assured that uh, Suez have very good relations with their their staff, and particularly on the, the Bracknell contract, where, uh, as I said, we work very much more in partnership rather than as a sort of an adversarial, uh, difficult relationship. Chairman, Councillor Hayes, may I just import yeah, there? Come in. Um, what uh, Kevin Gibbs has just said, one has to look at the other council, which is Windsor and Maidenhead, who don't have Suez, they have Veolia. And Suez, as a company working with Bracknell Forest, are very good and very clear with us. And I, at this point in time, have no problem with our contract with them. And what we have, we are extremely lucky with. But it is Veolia for Windsor, not Suez. Councillor Porter. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Hayes, I'm pleased with that response and, and, uh, and uh, 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 Kevin Gibbs. Uh, and I know that we do have a very good relationship with Suez, so long may that continue. Thank you. Councillor Birch, did you have a question? Thank you. On the same page, actually, I was just interested in the, um, the, the, the pressure of the bus service um, you know, because I have had in my ward a few sort of questions about the bus service and I know that uh, Councillor Chris Turrell helped me um, with some residents, but I was just curious, um, you know, you know, why we needed to do this. Were they going to um, cut some bus services that we, we call essential? Yeah, I can answer that one, Chairman. The, the pressure was related to the expected withdrawal of government grant which has been provided to support uh, bus services so that was due to run out in the end of September but the government did indicate um, a couple of weeks ago that they, they have extended that support until the end of March so that there may well be a, a, a challenge next year should they choose to withdraw but that that pressure that was highlighted at that moment in time has uh, has now been removed that's very good thank you Thank you. Then we're moving on to uh, page 52. 52. Chairman, if, if, I, if I could just make a, a comment on the, the financial position overall. So the, 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 the first quarter's return was based on information, as you know, to the end of June. At that point, it, it did look as though there was a, a positive position we were heading for a, a potential underspend. I have to report that every month since then, the position is worsening. So the council is facing the, the same pressures on inflation and, and other costs as uh, the rest of society is. So unfortunately, the, the, the most recent position is not as positive as is reported in this um, CPOR. Thank you, Stuart. Disappointing news, but thank you nonetheless. Even more up-to-date information, members. Um, can we just go to page 53? 
Um, item 2.0404, Business Improvement District. It's, it's just a comment. I don't know whether you can help us. Stuart, I picked up. It says the bid levy reporting is still an issue that the bid and the council are working to resolve so the bid can have an accurate picture of the levy it is receiving. Can you, can you educate us a little bit more about what that means, what it's about? I, I can indeed. Um, so when, when the Bracknell bid was established in April 2020, um, the, the big company decided that they wanted to apply caps to certain businesses rather than apply a flat percentage across the board. The consequence of that is that we were not able to use the standard modules within the Northgate system, which we use for business rates. Um, unfortunately, we have faced a position since then, because we're not using the standard modules, then the standard reporting, which allows us to easily extract the, the income uh, to date, has not worked since then. So we have been um, applying lengthy workarounds ever since, um, trying to engage with Northgate, but because Northgate have been dealing with things like uh, business grants, um, business rates, rebates, etc., it hasn't been their priority to look at a specific module within Brighton Forest's uh, rating approach. So we, we have recently engaged um, Sarah Kingston, who used to be the council's revenue manager, who has recently left the council to, to join a, a consultancy firm to, to help us engage with Northgate to work with the bid to identify the specific reporting requirements and to make sure that the enhancements needed to that module are put in place. So it's work in progress. It has been a, a challenge for, for the last two years or so. It, it has not been forgotten about, um, but, but it's not proven to be a simple solution. And it goes back to the way in which the, the Brighton bid wished to operate, which was perfectly reasonable at the time, but I don't think anyone quite anticipated the consequences in terms of the reporting. Thank you. Um, moving on, just just further down, a couple further down, um, under the highway improvements for sustainable travel, um, there was a public consultation, online public consultation. Do you, would you know how many people responded to that? And is that the future of public consultation for the authority? I'm afraid I would not know, Chairman. Okay, um, thank you. And, and I've got to take that one away. Thank you. Um, move on then to page 54, education and skills. Um, Jill, I don't know whether you all have any questions. No, thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. And, you know, the things that I'm talking about, we're dealing with that today in the Council. Okay, fine. Thank you. Um, anybody else? Questions on that page? No. Page 55, continuing on. Um, any questions there at all? Can I just on at the bottom of page 55, the very last item, review, review family safeguarding model, 0% um, and, and no commentary. I, I, I believe we have reviewed the family safeguarding model on a couple of occasions at least, Chairman. Um, so I'm, I'm really not sure why it's still in there as a, a as an action for, for the current year because it has been our adopted practice model for children's social care for at least two to three years. So I'm, I, I can't explain why it's even in there, let alone okay. why there's no You'll comment. take it away and have a look. <laughs> Who prepares the document? Um, 56, anybody? Page 56. The only comment I got is on L139. Percentage of schools rated good or better. Academy primary schools um, is amber. I think it should be green as it's 100%. It's, it's, it's definitely hard to exceed 100% chairman, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely, so it should be green. Um, moving on then to page 57. We're now under the section Caring for You and Your Family. Um, again, on page 58, one, two, three, four, fifth one down, 4.0106. 
develop CYP plan, no commentary. I can't you explain that, no, Chairman. No, no, I would, I would, no, I would expect we, away, we have sure. a Children and Young People's Plan, so um, I, I will take that one away Thank as well. Thank you. Yeah, yeah Joe. Chair, it says it's not due that it's in progress, but they haven't put it because it's not due to be finished and completed till twenty three. Yeah, no, but the, I do know that it is in progress because I have seen um, some of it, but they just haven't commented about it. It, it, it should be showing green then. Uh, I, I think so. It, it, it doesn't feel right somehow, Chairman. I think Kevin Gibbs is looking to come in, Chairman. Yeah, uh, not, 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 with, not with any help for our, um, commentary, to be fair. Um, I wonder if that last quarter is actually last year, but I'll, I'll take it away and come back, Chair, with an answer. Thank you, Chair. Just two comments on that one, Stuart. Uh, the first one is uh, regarding the biodiversity areas. It's nice to see, and it's most certainly nice to see the big yellow signs. Mm -hmm. So um, that's good work in progress. And the other one was the introduction of food waste into flats. And obviously, as we did the report on to food waste into flats, it's nice to see that it's coming to fruition. So uh, long may it continue. Moving on to uh, page 61. Any comments? No. Sorry. I can see Councillor Hayes, you had your, your hand up. I was going to comment, sir, to Councillor Porter that the I would like to let him know it is going extremely well on the, on the flats and we're hoping to get up to 500. And I'm sure he and I will meet up at some stage to discuss it. But we are doing very well. It's so successful on the housing, houses, we will be a council to be looked at. I look forward mm -hmm. to that conversation, that's all. So you'll meet again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> Councillor Ross. Um, maybe one that, that um, Stuart, you may need to come back to us on electric vehicle charging points. Have we submitted any applications for uh, funding from the government as part of the national scheme uh, to, to provide actually charging points in, in designated locations as opposed to funding it ourselves? I'm, I'm not able to answer that one, Chairman, I'm afraid. Uh, again, it won't be, maybe one which Kissam Gibbs can come in on. Yeah, yes, Chair. Uh I think all of our uh, additional EV charging points are grant funded. So we've got currently 32 um, uh, charging points to go in into our community shopping centres, uh, which is a piece of work we're progressing. We're also part of uh, a Berkshire-wide EV uh, group looking to see how we can encourage um, other uh, providers to come in and uh, plug the gaps. Um, but I've got uh, any specific uh, additional things to uh, mention, but I, I can see that Councillor Hayes wants to come in. Dorothy? Yes, um, it's a shame Councillor Brossard couldn't have been with us today, but be assured, sir, you will be on the next trip to see what is happening. But with regards to EVs, I, it's not my portfolio, it's Councillor uh, Turrell's, but I'm aware that there is going to be a letter going out that there are going to be some numbers of EV points put in community areas, which you will know about next week. But with myself, I would also say that 
working with Hazel Hill on uh, there will be good news coming out with regards to Warfield Park as well. We are going to be in the forefront in the next month, okay? But we will wait for that to come forward, sir. But as you know, it is always the borough first. Thank you. Let me move on. Uh, page 61. I don't know the answer to this, um, Stuart, but down the bottom there, it's got L418. Customer visits to Times Square zero, and the target is 5,000. How, how do we have a target of 5,000? Are we going to go around and lasso people to come into Times Square? Can, I don't expect you to have an answer, but it just seems a, a, a bit of a sloppy... It, 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 it feels as though it's a target which was pre-pandemic rather than one that reflects the, the current situation. So, yes, I'll take that one back. Because what it does mean is if we did have 5,000 people coming in in normal times... How are they communicating with us now? I mean, the door's open now, isn't it? Yes, people can yes. come in. I think that's the important, you know, we're there and we're open for business to meet you face to face, as it were. Thank you. We'll move on then to uh, 62, page 62. Uh, any questions? Nope. Just one item, 6.0302, addressing hate crime, down the bottom there. Um, this, the commentary, this action is still under progress and there is no further update this quarter. I, I find that if it's, if it's in, no, in not, progress... Not everything changes every quarter, Chairman. Um, so, some things have, have, have long periods through which they will be developed. Okay. We're on 62, we're on to page 63, we're nearly home and dry. Anybody? No. Down the bottom, L406, number of visits to libraries. It seems, again, it seems... Last quarter, 153,000-odd. This quarter, 57,000-odd. But the current target is 13,750. And these numbers just don't make sense. Yeah, well, I shall take that back, as will Kevin Gibbs, Chairman. OK, page 60... Oh, sorry, yeah. Mike. Further down, I was saying, following on, let me have a look. Um, where were we? Um, yes. 6.1008, which is to do with the UK, U Ukrainians, and I know questions being asked on that. Should there also be a section with regard to Afghanistan, uh, people who come into the community in terms of the numbers, just to get an indication of where we are? Because they're also a group who I believe we have provided a shelter for. Um, I can take that back to um, the team to consider, Chairman. Thank you. Page 64, 65, 66, and 67. That concludes. Thank you, Stuart, for taking those away and giving us answers to others. Okay. Appreciate Thanks, Chairman. It. Thank you. Uh, we now move on to item eight, which is the Environment and Communities Overview and Scrutiny Panel Report. Members will remember this from, from last time. Uh, first of all, Kevin, have you got anything to add to your report? No, Chair, I think uh, everything's contained within uh, uh, the panel's report. I'm happy to hand over to the Chairman of that panel. Thank you, Councillor Porter. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Kevin. Um, this report was uh, produced on the 7th of July this year. Uh, it was looking at integrated enforcement. Uh, 
currently we have three different types of enforcement. We have uh, enforcement from the highways and transport team. Then we have the civic enforcement, which is looking after illegal parking. Uh, and then we have enforcement from the public protection partnership. The review looked at whether or not uh, we worked well as a team, whether they worked well with uh, outside bodies such as Thames Valley Police, the Royal Berkshire Fire and Rescue Service. Uh, we heard from both of those uh, outside bodies. We also heard from um, a representative from the Royal Borough of Greenwich, who was looking at actually introducing integrated enforcement. And basically that presentation uh, highlighted that we've virtually got the integrated enforcement with our public protection partnership, which we are in partnership with West Berkshire. Um, and we just say that um, it, with the enforcement um, in the highways and transport team, we have uh, ele uh, sorry, 10 enforcement officers. Uh, in the civic one, we have six. Uh, and the public protection partnership uh, have quite a few officers. Um, but they actually look after 31 different services. So the uh, enforcement is actually v very vast. Um, and one of the recommendations when you see it is to make sure that um, uh, we look at our strategies and policies for enforcement and uh, that is our next uh, review. Uh, two uh, there's three other um, recommendations coming from that. One is uh, an introduction of the Community Safety Accreditation Scheme. Uh, and this will be in partnership with Thames Valley Police. It will enable us to put forward officers to have training, um, to give them extra powers. Um, some of it could be with, some of the examples would be with our, um, hopefully with our rangers, that they will then be able to enforce any dog fouling or littering. Um, and most certainly with lic within licensing, um, we do a lot of work with Thames Valley Police in um, stopping and checking vehicles. Um, we can make a big plan to have lots of officers and everything else present. And unfortunately, Thames Valley Police could pull out at the last moment. So by having officers trained and accredited, they would have the powers to actually stop the vehicles, the same as with Thames Valley Police. So that is one good thing. There are 40 different um, areas of the CSAS. So, you know, we would then look, hopefully have each department look at what would be good for their officers and hopefully a lot of officers would be put forward to have enhanced um, accreditation. Um, we also looked to make sure that when we do deal with complex um, cases of enforcement, that we actually have one lead member, rather than it just go from department to department to department, so that there is a focus, so it's not lost. Um, and obviously we would like to actually promote the amount of enforcement that is available and how uh, residents can notify us. Uh, one of the ones is like highways works. You know, if you see a road being dug up, make sure it has a work permit. Uh, and when that work permit runs from, and if it's overrunning, then please let us know. But we're hoping to actually have better enforcement and much stronger enforcement in future. Happy to take any questions, Chair. Any questions from members? Jill? Um, I'd like to make a comment first. I found this really interesting, and thank you. Um, and, and I welcome the fact that we're going to actually have, um, you know, to get stronger, because I know a lot of residents, you know, enforcement is quite difficult. Um, you know, we have these queries and, you know, helping them. And it's, I love the idea of a lead officer. I think that's really very powerful. So um, that I think that's really, really good. Um, and, I, and I think that will be a very positive um, thing to have for our for our residents so thank you for that uh, and thank you for this report I was really quite interested in the community safety accreditation scheme because at Bracknell Town Council we looked into this and our environmental officers actually were not keen on doing it because it's really quite something for them to actually then go up and say right I'm going to fine you for that and we came across a little bit of a resistance there so I'm just just mentioning this. Um, so it's really difficult. It's very easy if you're a policeman, you're in a policeman's uniform, but for a ranger to go up to someone and say, actually, you know, you shouldn't be fouling that. So these powers, 
I, I think this needs to be looked at a little bit carefully because we did on the town council and you know we actually lost environment obviously said if you're going to do this I'm not going to work for you and it it, beca it, be it was an issue so we ended up not doing it so um, I, I'm quite interested in this you know how it's going to roll out and how we're going to do it because I think it's it's, it's very easy for a policeman with that authority, um, but I'm, I'm quite concerned about that, saying to our um, people that we employ, actually, we want you to go and do this. Um, I, I'm not sure about it, really. I think, I think just to get the process right at the moment, we've got the report from the panel. Mm. The commission is being asked to accept the report, and then we would then forward that report to the executive and I think if the executive those some of those questions and answers would be for the executive to answer um, and indeed all come back and ask us to, to examine how it's going to work or, or they would put forward how it's going to work if they accept the recommendation so I think there's there's stages here to go through first rather than jumping in you know with all the detail if I, if I can actually just come in on that, um, uh, part of the training will actually be how the officers will actually remain safe uh, and how they actually approach people. Uh, and it, most certainly we wouldn't want to put any officer in any serious harm. Uh, but the training is very vigorous um, and there would be a uniform issued as well. So they would actually, they would actually have a, a specific uniform as well that would be identified. Uh, but um, we have been given assurance that the training is um, would in, it would encompass that. So let's make sure that they were when they approach people they were safe, uh, and it would be basically they would do it in twos, not in ones. So. Okay. Yes, Councillor Pearson mentioned that the Thames Valley Police were unable to participate in some training at the last moment. Is a new date proposed, or is, is who will actually make the next move in terms of the? Uh, training provision with Thames Valley Police. Uh, the training provision isn't with Thames Valley. No, the, the training provision isn't with Thames Valley Police. It's actually with um, providers that are that will provide the CSAS training. What I was talking about was that sometimes we will have um, a, a, an evening of enforcement, planned enforcement, and then Thames Valley at the last moment drop out. So therefore, a lot of officers' time and planning is wasted. So it's to ensure that we can actually plan ahead when we want to have strategic um, enforcement of certain areas um, and we will know that that will go ahead. You know, ideally, we would want to have Thames Valley Police involved all the time. However, there will be times where they might be called out at the last moment and then we would have the officers in place that it will still continue. So it, it's not to replace Thames Valley Police, it's just to have as a safeguard and a backup. Any other comments? No? Can I, John, I uh, think... Before I finish, yeah. uh, Chair, I would, I would just like to thank uh, our Democratic Services uh, Officer, Joey Gurley. Uh, he put a fantastic, well, a lot of hard work into helping getting this report where it is. So I'd like to personally thank Joey for all his hard work. Uh, and it was a pleasure in working with him. And, and also the rest of the panel. Well, I'm sure that will be minuted. So, um, so just to get the process what we're doing here is I'm asking you Will, to accept or otherwise the report of the panel or the commission and in doing so you're accepting the recommendations that are in there to put forward on to the executive and for them to consider the report and the recommendations does any member have a problem with that are you all I uh, don't have a problem with that, Chair. No? Okay. We're happy about that. That way, fine. Then, all of those in favour, let's have a formal vote on it. That's unanimous. Thank you. Chair, that's unanimous in the meeting. I'm not sure about online. Oh, they can't vote. Okay. I don't have a vote. That's the plus side of being here in the chamber in person. 
if it comes to something. Um, right, thank you for that one. So that's that. And then we come on to the last item of the evening, which is an update, item nine, the work programme update um, from Jill and Mike. Jill, do you want to go first? Thank you, Chair. Yes, of course. Um, so we actually have produced our um, send re review, but it didn't quite make this cutoff date because of August being a tricky month. So it will be coming in, Aug in October meeting, but actually it is complete now. Just got the last, um, we, we changed the order of a couple of um, recommendations and um, that's just being looked at by the department and then we'll bring it forward. Um, so that's that's all done. Um, I've got to say tonight, I think, oh, it's item nine actually, is the child criminal exploitation um, scoping document. So that's been done now. And we've actually got the meetings um, already in the diary, 29th of September, 3rd of October, 5th of October and 13th. And it's going to be a slightly shorter um, review. So we're hoping to do it in that amount of time. So um, be ready for February um, to be to be reported. Jill, if I can, that, that scoping document um, at the moment it's not complete. This scoping document is complete, right. um, and it's um, it's ready for to be looked at tonight. I thought it was item nine. Page 87. And those meetings that I've outlined are the actual ones that we've, we've got in the diary so far. But this is the scoping document. This originally was county lines, but during... Um, COVID, of course, county lines changed uh, and it morphed into different things. Mm -hmm. So that's why we've um, renamed it Child Criminal Exploitation to actually take in those changes. If you're happy with that, I'll take that as red. And if everybody's comfortable, that's sort of thing. And on the 28th of September, the panel is going to have a meeting just to discuss what we've done in the last two and a half, nearly three years, and to look at forward plan and make sure we're going to be up to date towards the end of this term of the council. So um, I think that um, a lot of work has been done. I mean, the um, SEND review, we did a lot of meetings and a lot of visits and it was very detailed so the panel worked yeah. really well actually uh, and i thank them for all their hard work in fact really so, so just to add on to what councillor birch has said quite a lot a, lot, a great deal of your work in fact was done on county lines but what has happened this has now been transferred into child exploitation one thing actually leads to the other effectively mm. but i think the emphasis now is on child exploitation rather than just county lines per se. Mm. See, during the pandemic, um, as we all know, people weren't moving around. So county lines actually changed its, its operation. And what happened was it became in-house. So in areas, they exploited young people and they actually developed networks within areas instead of having people travel from big cities and from different areas. Um, because as we know, the trains weren't being used and you know people weren't using transport and people weren't moving around. And what happened, because there weren't many people moving around, if people were moving, they actually stood out and the police were catching them. So actually, it, 
you can understand why during the pandemic it changed. So it's, it's very interesting how lots of things changed during the pandemic, but this was one of them. So, um, <laughs> but it's really interesting. It goes with all panels, the three panels, and everybody that takes part. I, I think the, the degree of work ethic is tremendous. And, uh, and it's, uh, everybody should be congratulated for that, but equally the three chairmen for steering it that way as well. Um, back to the commission and then onwards to the exec, which is huge. But uh, as I said before, I mean, so far, the, the reports since we've had this system that we've produced, what we've agreed and gone to the exec, have all been accepted by the exec. Um, like without exception, and I think that, that's proof of the, the degree of work that's gone into them. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you for your kind words, and I, I agree, all the chairmen have worked really hard, and certainly all the panel members um, and people who have taken part, it's been, it's been really good. And, um, and democratic services. Democratic services have really yes. supported us, um, you know. And I know we've had a few changes, but all the new people also are really good, um, and we're very fortunate. I think we're very fortunate as well with the support. Okay, um, Mike, can you update us on on your panel? Yes, uh, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, uh, we've got a meeting due on the 6th of October where we hopefully are looking at blue badges. We will have a scope for you for the next meeting um, uh, once I get approval from the panel, but um, I think I will on this, uh, looking at safeguarding in adults. We will be doing the uh, blue badge review, which is just an internal review, so it doesn't require, um, I don't think, as much as a scope, because it's going to be a very um, brief looking at the effect of what we had um, on the blue badge, which uh, I presented it just over a year ago. It's my first uh, move on to it. So 6th of October, um, which is the next meeting shortly after. No, it's the Monday after the 6th of October, because that's that's the next commission. But uh, we'll be reporting back to you on that. Louise? Yes, it's the 10th, I think. Mike. 10th, yes. Sorry, I got the date wrong. 6th is the next meeting that we've got. Um, so... Oh, hang on a second, I know. Yeah, um, so that's it for the moment, Chair, on what we, we're coming forward with. So, so but you will, have a scope, you will have a scope at the next meeting. A scope at the next meeting, which is before you've met. The next meeting um, is the 6th no, of October for the Commission. Yeah, we're, we're having a meeting on the 10th, but right. there is work that we're doing on the... Um, and we're going to hopefully have a meeting to... Uh, um, to actually finalise what that is before it comes to you, and then we're hopefully going to do that meeting on the tenth. Okay, so if it's approved so by then, on the sixth. So then the scope is coming to us. What in the November meeting? No, the sixth. Uh, sorry, Mike. It's Louise. I think we might have to send the scope to the November meeting, but we. All oh, right. We agreed we'll probably do some preparatory work in the in the interim if we've got one that's sort of fairly formed. All right, thank you. Well, this John, where are you? Back to you again. <laughs> thank you, Chair. Um, uh, at the last meeting, obviously, the scope for looking at the strategy and policy of enforcement was approved, and our first meeting is on the 26th of October. I think that concludes the meeting. Thank everybody, but I will point out the next commission meeting is the 6th of October. <laughs> well, I've got something like the season. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks everybody. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you, Chair. Good night. Good night Thank everyone. you. Thank you. Thanks.